UX Podcast is funded by me and Pad, together with contributions we get from you, our listeners. If you'd like to contribute, you can do so financially, but also as a volunteer. We'd love your help to make sure we get our transcripts and show notes published for each show. So raise your hand to help by emailing us at uxpodcast at uxpodcast.com. UX Podcast Episode 238. I'm Per. And I'm James. And this is UX Podcast, balancing business, technology, and people every other Friday since 2011, with listeners in 194 countries around the world from Singapore to Tanzania. Tim Cariotis is a research fellow in regulation and design at the Melbourne School of Government and is currently researching in the space of digital health ethics, privacy, and smart cities. Tim has been talking about privacy and contextual integrity for many years, particularly in relation to healthcare. So he joined us to talk more about embedding privacy into design. So Tim, um, maybe we can start off just by um, asking you what, what privacy, what is privacy? That's a really great and a surprisingly hard question to answer, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there is more than a few books on this issue. I think that privacy is both a legal concept, and I'm not a lawyer, so I, I don't spend too long thinking about the legal side of things, apart from how it intersects with the things I'm interested in, which is, I guess, the social idea of privacy. I would also say that privacy, um, it's a social concept. We use it a lot in day-to-day life to talk about uh, when someone's usually breached our privacy. But I think most importantly, privacy is a feeling. Like when you feel like your privacy is being breached, it, it's, a, it's a feeling that feels a bit, something feels wrong. Like, and when you, when someone introduces something new to you that you think breaches your privacy, you know somewhere deep inside that that feels wrong. And usually we ascribe that feeling to, to privacy. And I think that for most people, they might then link that to some legal idea, but I think it really starts with a feeling. And I think that's something which um, needs a lot more investigation, especially as we enter a new digital world about how these feelings play out and how people uh, adapt to those feelings. But for me, it's, it's a legal concept. It's, it's a sociology concept. But it's also something that we feel. Yeah. So I guess, yes, you've also got that privacy is, is, um, is a in data thing. So it's kind of things are, about me, but it's also a physical privacy, or a, um, sort of physical of myself and physical of the of the domain that I see as my my own. So, like this is my, this is my private office, you could say, um, and and I have some privacy while I'm in my private space, and I can share things privately in that space. So I can see feel that this is straight away like a lot of levels and a lot of concepts around privacy. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, it's interesting to think back to where privacy first started and the the first discussions about privacy. And it's it's interesting thinking about privacy as a very masculine concept because I would say it's very um, patriarchal in that it was about the man having domination over his household. And there's some wonderful feminist scholarship actually uh, critiquing privacy and how it's developed from those roots which I think is is really interesting to consider when we think about issues such as domestic violence and family violence and how privacy can act against people in that situation where people feel like they can't uh, question what goes on behind someone's closed doors. Now, so the degree of ownership, of course. Well, privacy, privacy is ownership. In a way. Well, yeah. I, lo- I love what that insight about what you're saying about because it's also emotions. It's also about how I'm feeling about my space, my belongings, uh, and sometimes you can't really put a finger on what was it that made me feel this way, which also implies that privacy can be very different for different people, uh, and so that makes it really hard to regulate around it because who gets to decide what privacy is, and if the patriarchy is deciding that, perhaps because they define themselves as having the most to lose, then loss is a big part of it. Who, who loses what and in what perspective? Mm, That's a very good point. And I think that in my space of healthcare, I think a lot about who gets to define um, the privacy norms in the healthcare setting. And there's a really wonderful theory and book by Helen Nissenbaum that 
situates privacy as being about information norms. And the work I've been doing is trying to really think about how those norms come about and how they get challenged by technology and who gets to decide how those norms develop. And for me in, in healthcare, it's, it's fascinating to think about the role of the increasing role that our service users play in starting to define what information is important and when it's important. But also, you know, for me, critical theory comes in here because there's a lot of surface level understandings of, of health, of government, of any sector of our lives. But then when you dig a little bit deeper, if that's using feminist theory, decolonization theory, you can start to really see some complex power dynamics here, which are really shaping what we consider as legitimate information and legitimate reasons to share or not share information. So that when, you, when we're talking about um, norms around privacy, I mean, is this is this when we consider what we feel is is okay information to be shared? Um, so, like, if I'm talking to you now, a, a norm around that would be, of course, my I think it's okay to share my name with you. It'd be kind of weird not to share my name with you when we're doing a, an interview. Um, but there might be other things about me that I would consider in this context not to be normal, I guess, to share with you. Yes, and that's a really great example. Um, the example I always use is um, if I'm out at a bar with one of my friends and I point over to some guy at another table and tell them that I think that guy's cute and they go and tell the guy I said that, that that might be breaching a norm. I would probably not expect my friend to go do that. But then if, if we end up getting married and have a happy life, I might not worry about it. Like the actual outcome might, might be very different. But the way, um, Helen, the way Helen Nisenbaum describes norms is she says you can break it down. You can say that in any norm situation, there's different actors. There's the sender of the information. There's the receiver of the information. And there's the subject of the information. There's the type of information. Is it information about my feelings towards some guy at the bar? Is it information about my health? And then there's these things called transmission principles. So it's kind of this expectation. So if you tell me your name, you probably don't attach too many principles around how I should use that. But if you were to share with me something really personal, you would probably expect that I wouldn't share that with anyone who doesn't already know that. Or you might expect um, there's some information that you might share with me and you would expect that I would reciprocate the information. Um, and if I don't, you might find that a bit a bit weird and um, not following the social norms of this conversation. Wow. So, so, so tell us a bit about how this applies to our work in design, because it, it seems really, really difficult to I understand the, the thinking that each individual user of your site has, of course, around what they want to protect and what is okay for them to share with you and for you to share with third parties. Mm. So the way I think that this fits into design, and I, I think a lot about privacy by design, and for me, privacy by design is really saying that we should consider design in, in the way we build our processes, our technologies, our systems, so that when things, it's not about things going wrong as an artist having a recourse in the law. Sadly, privacy by design is really engineering by design at the moment. It's mostly engineers creating technologies that are privacy preserving. But I would argue that designers have a real key role in the design process in terms of questioning the norms in any situation before a technology is developed, questioning the technology and the assumptions behind it. So I do a lot of work in electronic health records and I think of in Australia, we have a thing called the My Health Record, which is a national electronic health record. And when I think about the national electronic health record and how that defines the norms and even just defines the context of healthcare, it's very different to the norms and context that we actually see on the grounds on the ground in healthcare. So I would say that's a perfect place for a designer to actually start to say, okay, well, what, what are the different norms uh, assumed in the technology and what are the actual norms in practice and how can we close that gap in the design decisions we're making? Um, and this is also a great place, not just for UX designers, but also, also for service designers to work together in this space in terms of defining the norms. And if, if they're feeling really adventurous, they could start to think about how did these norms come about? And if they introduce the technology, a certain powerful stakeholder is going to appropriate that in ways that uh, other stakeholders might find uh, not to their privacy expectations. So we're living in a world where uh, having information about people is very profitable. Uh, so I agree completely with challenging the norms and that being the role of the designer. But how how do you get the mandate to also act on that insight and act on that knowledge? Mm. 
I think consumers are moving with their feet. I think that's one thing. I think we're increasingly seeing, especially in the technology space, we're seeing a convergence of privacy norms. So when I think about Apple and Samsung, over the last decade or so, we've seen that their privacy features have become very similar because people have started to expect certain privacy features. And whether or not those privacy features are good or not, the fact that they expect them mean that, means that any technology company which now doesn't have those features is seen as an outlier. So I think that you can sell, you can sell these privacy norms. And that feeling I spoke about at the start, that icky feeling when you feel like someone's breached your privacy, that's a really powerful feeling. And I think about um, in Australia, once again, the My Health Record, many people had that icky feeling and it led to the government passing legislation to try and address those issues. The same now with things like COVID-19 tracing apps. We know that in Australia and other countries, governments have worked really hard to address feelings that many people couldn't pinpoint to a legal issue or to any actual risks in the technology, but a feeling that it didn't really sit with the norms that they expected in their relationship with government. So I do think it's a really powerful thing for designers to bring um, to the team, and I don't think anyone else in the team is probably going to be doing that role. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting example about um, like contact tracing apps um, right now. That um, there you've got a you've got a specific context, um, and I can imagine that many people will will go into um, well there will be an implied or a, a implicit um, agreement as they go into using the app to use certain data in that context, and that context is very relevant now. But how do we manage and maintain um, context that shifts over time? Because I might not want them to have this information or do anything with it at all in a year's time or so on. Yeah, and I guess that's a really good point around how context change. And this is of of great interest to me. And I think with things like the COVID-19 tracing apps, this is why we've seen in Australia, the federal government be very clear in the legislation about what uh, what context this data will not leak into. So being, being, being very clear that it will only be used in certain contexts. I'm unsure if they've actually set a time limit to that, which I think is an interesting question because I think in a crisis, we do make a trade-off. We do say that there are certain uh, societal values and so certain, certain um, goals and ends that we're happy to change these norms for. But I think context is an interesting thing because context can be defined in many ways. And I, I think of several that... There's the context that we define through institutions. So if you think about healthcare, the hospital hospital is a context. But then that that might be very different to my experience of the healthcare system. For me, healthcare is actually my friends and family who I go to for support. And then as a technology designer, and usually you're already given a technology, you're given a general idea of something you're designing, and that in itself comes with a, a, a context. And I think the challenge for designers when they're Um, Thinking about context, uh, if that's a context in one time and space or over time, is what context are they being forced to see through the lens of the technology and how can they actually look at other ways of viewing that context? Because I think that's going to bring out different privacy norms that they might not ever realise if they keep looking at the context through the lens of the technology. It makes me think also as well now that um, when you're, you know, we design on so many different levels. Is one thing designing the collection of information from the initial interface between the user or the provider of the of the information or the person who's giving up privacy um, for, for your purpose um, and various interfaces or, or um, views of that information behind it. I mean, it might be that if I'm giving that information directly to my doctor, it's one thing, but um, further down the information chain, there might be other medical staff looking that information i mean how do we make sure that the initial context travels with it that is a huge challenge and i think it's it's something that i think we're still trying to grapple with even in the age of artificial intelligence and machine learning where one piece of data can take on so much meaning i think The first thing we can do is we can start to think about privacy as less of an individual issue and more of a social issue. I think that's really important because when we start to think about groups of people, so I work in the mental health space mostly with my research, and we start to critically think about uh, what mental health service users or lived experience users uh, want and need, 
I think it makes it easier because we're not just focusing on um, service user by service user. So thinking about that social value of privacy and how do we take the context with it? For me, I think it's it's looking at ways that we can capture context. How do we capture context and in what words and language? Um, I'm a sociologist, so I tend to draw on a lot of sociology theory from people like Paolo Freire, who spoke about grounding meaning in the in the language of those right at the bottom of the period pyramid. So he was working with um, very poor people in Brazil and trying to teach them English. And he was thinking, why why isn't this working? I'm using these flashcards of oranges and apples on that the, them. And they didn't even know what oranges and apples were. So he said, well, maybe if I start by understanding their context and the words that they put to things, I can I can better move this forward. So I think the design is actually understanding the language of all the different stakeholders is a key point to then working out how context is different and viewed differently between different uh, people in the chain and then working out how you design for that. Yeah, that's really good. I, I'm, I'm instantly thinking actually of something simple that we all have on our websites, cookies. And we all have this, these disclaimers around uh, accept these cookies and these cookies we have because we want to create a better user experience for you. But that is the designers of the system deciding what is the better experience based on that type of data. So they've never ever ha had the uh, design process where they include the people whose information they are taking to improve the experience to actually debate uh, or, or ascertain whether or not it's worth it. Mm. And I'm a big uh, proponent of participatory design in, in all its flavors. I think that mm. actually bringing in people whose data is being used and actually not, and I think no, I'm very, participation for me is a weird thing because I think sometimes we can get so caught up in ideas of co-design and uh, really deep ideas of, we get into the theory of it all, but I think it's having that letter of participation all the way from consultation to citizen control and then using all those different tools in our uh, process and it could be as simple as some of the work I'm doing at the moment where I'm just calling some of my participants and going hey we had this conversation and this is how I've interpreted it, interpreted it does that make sense like how I've understood it and how I'm applying it and that's really just consultation but it's really powerful and I think when we get too caught up in trying to do co-design over time we sometimes lose those other elements of participation that can be just as important for designers just to check in and say hey does this make sense and then moving forward yeah, that makes me. I think... have to share what what uh, what I'm actually doing now with with nurses as well. I'm sending short clips, videos uh, of interfaces out to them, explaining what we're changing, uh, and they're feedbacking, uh, and they do it in their own time because it's video, so they can do it in their own time because these are busy people, and that's the same thing. They're actually just it's a sort of consultation, but then over time they also can see, hey, I have that idea and you changed it, and they realize, oh my god, I'm part of the process. Mm. Those feedback loops are so important. Yeah, it made me think now as well about going back to the beginning where we talked about legal privacy as well, and what you per just said about cookies. Uh, we have those terms and conditions things as well as cookie disclaimers that we, we have massive bits of long legalese that no one reads, no one understands. But yet this is what we ground the rights that we give up in many cases of websites in. Um, so I, I guess, see, reflecting on what both of you are saying here, we really should be working on checking that checking in with our users according to that text and saying, hey, you know, we, I know we've got all this legal text, but if I put it like this to you, does that sound okay? Mm. And I think doing some journey mapping is a really powerful tool. I think it's a, it's a, you know it's it's an essential tool for any UX designer. But doing some journey mapping around norms, and if you're going to introduce something which is going to change those norms, that and working out when someone gets that icky feeling, that could be a really great time to introduce a bit of a check in and say, hey, just a little reminder. You know, this was in the terms and conditions, and that might be a good or a bad thing. That might be a, hey, we're using your data for this, but, you know, just in case you didn't realize, or, a, hey, we're actually protecting your data. Mm. But I think the fact that you're acknowledging that people are going to have that bit of an icky feeling, I think that's really powerful. And obviously, we would like to move on to mitigating that, but I think the acknowledgement is, is just as an important step. And that means you're actually adding, again, you're adding context because you're actually presenting the idea of taking that data within the context of taking it instead of having them read something that they've read maybe a year ago in uh, terms of service statements. Mm, yeah, and that temporal element, I think, is is really 
key because I think about the type of services I engage with and sometimes they send me a little link saying, hey, we've updated our terms and conditions. But it is, you know, we're really engaging in a relationship with our uh, customers or our clients or our service users. And like any good relationship, it's always good to have a bit of a check-in. It's always good to uh, say the things that seem common sense. But once again, that, that icky feeling uh, in any sort of uh, customer-client relationship, sometimes that's really hard to voice. So if, if the um, actual service provider or uh, product maker actually just creates that space, I think it can be really powerful for people. I think now it's all about how, um, you know, that icky feelings we're saying, um, some organizations might not have the same feeling as you when it comes to this. And that, I know many of us have struggled with that over the over the years where you find yourself in organizations where, oh, you're, shocked, you're a bit shocked maybe about how, how data is used or manipulated and realize through your own work how little knowledge sometimes maybe people have about it mm. and one of the things i guess that i am thinking of more more recently in terms of the role of design is, is actually where designers fit in the data governance process and i think things like the, G, the uh, general data protection regulation or regulation protection for gdpr um, things like that really do push us towards uh, needing good data governance strategies and i think that's where designers can play another really big role for me, I'm thinking more and more about a more uh, participatory data governance. Right now, we have a very laissez-faire data governance where as long as you're following the rules of what not to do, you can kind of do whatever you want and you have your notice and consent. But I think that you can really sell engaging participants in the data governance process and setting the values around data news and the principles around data news is actually a selling point because that makes you different to any other company. If you can point to a data governance process which has participatory elements, has certain values and say, hey, we're only going to use your data for these things that you've helped us outline, I think people will look at that and go, oh, that's really different to other organizations who just want me to sign my notice and consent and who never talk to me again. So that's where I'm moving to with my work, really thinking about how designers, their role in creating really good data governance processes but actually bring participants into the process of discussing this long-term use of data. This also brings into brings into trust. I mean, you're, what you're talking about there is 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 building up trust, um, tr uh, trustworthy relationship between clients and organisations. That if I've if I see that you behave like that with my data from day one, then I'm going to maybe have that expectation, or rather, I'm going to understand that should your use of my data or or how you wish to use my data changes, that you're actually going to ask me and you're going to have a dialogue with me because we've built that relationship up. Yeah, definitely. And I think I always think with my own example, I look out to the rest of the world and think, where has this happened before? And I think in terms of a participatory deliberation around data, we can look at things like participatory budgeting, which happens in Brazil and in some states of the US and in other places around the world as well. And participatory budgeting is, is kind of like that. It's a trusting relationship between citizens and in, in that case, government, where they're deciding around how money should be used. And it's not easy. Like people have fought to set up those uh, participatory budgeting processes over decades. And I think that in, in our work, we need to realize that this stuff doesn't happen overnight and that it might take a long time. And I think that some of it's going to come from the consumer, some of it's going to come from government. I think that many governments will not sit still on this and we will see new data governance strategies imposed on organisations in the near future. I would say the GDPR is one step in a very long and winding journey we're going to have towards new um, conceptualizations of privacy and data governance. So I would say that organisations that can get onto this today are going to be well set up to what the changes that are going to come in the next few years and decades. So if, if you're a designer today and you really you really aren't thinking about privacy at all because it hasn't been part of your uh, work specification essentially, where do you start? How do you get started thinking about this? Because I'm going to probably argue that most designers who work at, at least on large websites haven't even read their own websites terms of service and privacy policy. That's a, a really great question. And I think it's really hard. Like even me as a researcher, I have very rarely read a terms and conditions policy. And I, I'm, I, look, in some ways, I feel a bit ashamed saying that. But in other ways, I think that, you know, even if I did read these, many of the websites I access are essential. So like, you know, they're essential. I could not access them. 
Look, I think a great starting place is I love reading, so I would recommend a lot of books. The book I kind of always go back to, it's a bit of my Bible, is Privacy in Context by Helen Nissenbaum. And the reason it's a bit of a Bible for me is because it does provide a bit of an outline of privacy as, as a legal concept, but then goes into that icky feeling that we were talking about and how we actually start to conceptualize that in words that we can use in our work. I also think that just actually list, like our customers and our service users tell us so much, like any Reddit blog forum, you're going to read streams and streams of people talking about how they're conceiving privacy and when they think privacy is being breached. So that's probably going to give you a good starting point in terms of thinking about a more social idea of privacy that you might not get in some of your other news testing. But I would say, you know, read, listen, and talk to people. If someone wants to have a, a coffee Zoom date with me, I'm happy to chat about it for hours on end. And I think that having those interdisciplinary connections across the organization and across organizations is, is a really important way that we should be moving forward in this space. Thank you so much. That was a perfect note to end on. Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. So something I, I think is going through a lot of listeners' minds uh, as we're talking to Tim is that, okay, so, so you want me to be able to code, you want me to consider accessibility, you want me to understand download times, and now you also want me to be an expert on privacy. And it seems like we keep adding and adding and adding all these things that, uh, that the UXer has to be responsible for. Did we ever say and this was my response simple? To that is, I mean, my response to that is, yes, and that is exactly why we can't, always be only one UXer per project. That's why we need many UXers because everything that impacts human well-being is our responsibility. Responsibility, responsibility. I mean, well, I think, I think, I mean, it's within the, our the, interest. Yeah, exactly. There's the the, the mm. whole thing of awareness, and this is mm. something we've touched on mm. many times. That mm. uh, what we have, we're like magnets when it comes to these kind of things. We we are the hub. We are where all these little bits and bobs connect together in many mm. organizations, and you can't possibly be a specialist in all of them. There's just mm. not enough hours in your career to be a specialist in all of these different things. But um, And you're right, when we talk about should we code, um, the one of the things that we say that, no, you don't have to actually do the coding, but by understanding coding, by understanding how your program develops CSS, um, understanding how information um, systems work and how the privacy laws work and, and how consent works, all this kind of stuff helps you as a designer produce a more robust and more um, beneficial experience to the people on the other side. Exactly. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it's not always the responsibility, but it, it, I mean, it makes us better designers, just that awareness. And that's why reading books other than design books also makes us better designers because it's, it's part of understanding the human experience. Mm -hmm. And when we're down to, again, I guess, the whole thing of curiosity. And, mm -hmm. and I, I personally think that the, the best designers I work with um, are the cur most curious ones. Because the, if if you're just producing, um, then you, there's so much that's just passing you by, and, and yeah. that's where the that's where the risk creeps in, of of doing things that harm others, that doing things that are suboptimal, doing things that you know aren't going to be a good way of doing something. Right, and you have to explore stuff to understand what you will learn from them. You, you'll always be surprised. You will always n learn something that will be of use and value to, your, to you, not, maybe not now, but somewhere along the line. And, and this conversation with Tim, um, uh, my, my, my geek um, bells were tingling all the time. I mean, this, this, um, we could have literally talked for hours about you know, uh, information concepts and flow and structure and um, interfaces between information points. There's so much we could talk about here. And we're not, we're not academics in this area, but um, mm. but I, I start seeing how this um, impacts on so much that we do. Um, mm. And I, I get a bit I excited about that. Yeah, but I actually think his example was so good. We didn't linger upon it, really. But the, the example he had where he's with a friend in a bar, he says that that guy looks cute. Uh, and his friend walks over and tells him, oh, my friend over here look, says you look cute. And that perhaps passes a line. But then he also said, well, what if it happens then that 
we get married in the end. So mm -hmm. the outcome is always more interesting than the the ethical standpoint you may have in the moment of where you actually are thinking, well, you, you've passed the line there. You, I didn't want you to do that. Mm -hmm. But the outcome of it turned out really, really well. And uh, you never know. No. And that was, that's what makes it so difficult. That's why you always need to be communicating. And I'm going to do a, I'm yeah. gonna do a yes and there part of that one because mm -hmm. what I was thinking of as well with just that example, and it was so good, is it was used an example of how you know that was the information he gave to his friend and then the friend did something that was out of mm. the, the 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 rules of the game or such but yeah. then i was thinking yeah but what if it was one of those situations where he said that because he actually wanted the friend to actually go over and it was one of those kind of like implied things oh god he's really cute and because he dared go over himself so he said right. it to his friend because he knew his friend was the type of person that <laughs> would go over and say something so it actually was planned all along mm. It gets complicated. We're into psychology again. It does. And again, you acknowledge uh, how different we all are, how, how different our sense of privacy is, that some people are okay with people walking into their homes and grabbing stuff, but others just are not. Hmm. Uh, so that it, it makes it so much more complicated. But it, it also really, really uh, emphasizes the point that you have to always, always be aware about these different um, feelings that people may have and, and actually treat people uh, uh, in a sense, not not perhaps as you yourself would, would like to be treated, but ask them how they want to be treated. That's mm. the important point. Yeah. Always be asking people how they want to be treated. Never assume. Well, uh, which is interesting. So if, they, if we think, um, um, well, Jared Spool talks about um, um, current knowledge. Yeah. Like, you know, to, rather than talk about consistency, he talks about current knowledge and like understanding what is the user's current knowledge of a situation. Here we're talking about um, current relationship. What is the current relationship between the user of a system um, and the system or the organization um, itself? How do you assess yeah. the, the current relationship and the level of trust? Like how, going back to the example in the bar, how do I know whether it's one of the situations where I'm telling my friend, it's a friend that I would tell stuff in confidence to, or it's mm. a friend that I would use as a proxy to do something for me because I don't do it myself. That, you know, they're very specific to the, the, those relationships. And you've mm. learned that over time, over years, maybe even decades. Whereas in the context of a digital product or website, We've got to we've got to understand this, or at, or like you say, ask. Do we ask about it all the time? We can't ask too much because that d destroys the relationship too. It's it's a dynamic and interesting and powerful uh, mechanism. Yeah. This that we're talking about that understanding of it be actually being relationships is so important. Uh, I remember seeing a tweet yesterday where someone got an email from an organization that, that started with. Since you uh, used our services in the past and we've had contact and it treated them sound like friends, and he realized, well, I attended a course from this company eight years ago mm -hmm. and hasn't heard a word from them since. But now, all of a sudden, out of the blue, they, they're treating him like, oh, you've used our services and we're, we're, we, will, we would like to have you back. And that, that's just creepy. <laughs> yeah. I think I got an email the other week um, f and I had no idea who the company was. Um, <laughs> so I actually checked out a bit and it turned out that they'd they'd changed name or they'd been bought or so it wasn't the same company as mm -hmm. when I'd last used them but of course mm -hmm. they just moved the data to the new company and lost oh. me on the way so so this is one of those things again about context the context had changed the relationship had mm -hmm. changed the relationship was old and and that then became really weird and I just got frustrated I mean what, what you what do you mean emailing me you shouldn't be emailing me because I don't know you. And that's when you, that's when you get the icky feeling. That's what yes. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using that because I think we need icky feeling tests and icky feeling workshops where people really talk about what could actually creep people out and, or make them feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So going back to how, how you, if you're the one in charge of doing that newsletter or news, uh, um, you know, email, um, how do you assess who's going to get that icky feeling? Mm. How do you how do you check the val the validity um, of the information you're using to reach out and do that? Right, it's not That's really easy. Interesting. Yeah, I always say to people: never send something, the first version, to your full list. Always send to a segment. Always be be aware that you will always need some some feedback before you send to everyone. Mm -hmm. Freshness of data. I mean, and GDPR mm. kind of covers some of this. Like you've, you've, you shouldn't keep data forever. 
um, and I think some of the examples we're talking about now actually show in a in a practical way rather than just a legal way why um, it's it's risky using stuff that you don't know where it's come from or you don't know how old it is or the context it was gathered in or exactly you know so on. And we did touch upon, uh, of course, the the topic of terms and conditions. Uh, and you you dug up an old episode of ours uh, as a recommendation to listen to next. Mm. It was like seven years ago. It is seven years ago, 2013, when we talked to um, Per Lennerer, um about simplifying terms and conditions. It's a really good chat. Mm. Um, uh, we do have a problem with your sound, though, Per, during that episode. Um, your mic That's broke. That's that one. Yeah. Yeah, but um, if you ignore them bits, then it's still a good listen. It's the other pair who, who you need to listen to. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for listening. Always a pleasure. Quick reminder, you can contribute to funding UX Podcast by visiting uxpodcast.com slash support. And don't forget to volunteer to help us with publishing. Remember to keep moving. See you on the other side. What did the termite say as he walked into the bar? I don't know, Pad. What did the termite say as he walked into the bar? Is the bar tender here? Get it? Is, oh, is the bar tender? I, I, oh, I was I was just about to say I don't get it, and then the penny dropped. He's going to eat the bar, isn't he? Oh. <laughs>